Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you to the panel chairs and to Sages for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have no financial disclosures, but I'm gonna leave this up for seven seconds. So I wanna tell you that my real disclosure is that like any good surgeon, I like to base my practice on superstition and my most recent complications. <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, try and present some evidence today despite that. So when I think about gastropexy and paraesophageal hernia repairs, um, these are the two questions that came to my mind, and I hope, I hope this is similar to what the, the panel chairs were looking for. So my first question, always what's on my mind, is recurrence risk. And so my first question was, can we reduce the recurrence risk of paraesophageal hernias by adding gastropexy or gastropexy by G-tube to our repair uh, procedure? And then the second question that comes up is, can we reduce surgical risk by performing gastropexy alone. So when I'm presenting here, I usually like to start with the SAGES guidelines. Um, some of these were already presented by Dr. Ao Yang, but uh, the SAGES guidelines for paraesophageal hernia repair are from 2013. We do have one specifically about gastropexy in this setting, and it states that gastropexy may be safely used in addition to hiatal hernia repair, and that's a, a recommendation that's strong, so it's actually based on good evidence. So we know that it can be safely added to a paraesophageal hernia repair. Um, the question is, is it effective? And the studies have really had mis mixed results on efficacy. Um, that is, you know, can the addition of the PEXI reduce recurrences? So Dr. Ponsky um, wrote a paper in 2003 looking at the addition of anterior gastropexy as is shown here. Um, to a traditional paraesophageal hernia repair. And you can, you can note from this picture from the publication that a partial fundoplication was part of this procedure. So they were using the gastropexy not as a replacement, but as an adjunct. This was kind of a large case series with 28 patients. Um, they did have radiographic follow-up, you know, sort of a short to medium term follow-up of one to two years. I guess that's medium term. Um, and they actually had no recurrences in this series in that time frame, which I think is, is great. Um, and as I noted, all of the patients also had had uh, fundoplication in that series. There's a larger series out of France more recently uh, with 89 patients. These patients also had radiographic follow-up at two years. Um, in this series, they had enough patients to have some recurrences, but they did find a statistically significant difference between the groups that had the addition of the gastropexy and without the gastropexy. So my summary for question one is that I actually think that addition of gastropexy may reduce recurrence risk when other key aspects of repair are performed. So excision of the sac in the chest, esophageal lengthening procedure as Dr. Galvani illustrated, and um, you know, your repair of the hiatus or your curl closure. So the second question that I brought up is, can we reduce surgical risk by potentially performing gastropexy alone? So what, what am I talking about surgical risk? Because really laparoscopic paraesophageal hernia repair is a fa fairly low, maybe moderate risk procedure these days, I think in most of our hands. But some of the things I think about are that, um, you know, prolonged general anesthesia for our elderly patients can result in durable cognitive decline. Um, and then uh, capnothorax is also something that we may face. It's, not always uh, terribly clinically significant in terms of post-operative complications, but those are some of the things that I think about when I think about how could we reduce risk further. And so I think about this type of case of, you know, potentially an uh, especially elderly or frail patient that you're seeing in your clinic with this problem, as many of these patients are, or um, as was mentioned previously, you know, potentially a more urgent or emergent case with gastric volvulus um, where the patient's, uh, you know, emergent presentation results in additional operative risk. So we do have some guidelines, um, additional guidelines that I'm gonna share from SAGES. Our guideline regarding gastrostomy tube placement is that it may facilitate post-operative care in selected patients in this setting. That's a strong recommendation. Um, so the addition of gastrostomy tube has been suggested potentially for venting, for bloating symptoms, or delayed gastric emptying. Um, and potentially for nutrition or giving medications. Uh, 
We also have this guideline that hernia reduction with gastropexy alone and no hiatal repair may be a safe alternative in high-risk patients, but may be associated with high recurrence rates. That's weak, so it's not based on great evidence. Um, but the recommendation that formal repair is preferred is a strong recommendation, so based on, on better evidence. So um, as I mentioned, those guidelines are from 2013. So I did want to review some of the evidence that's been published since then. So there is a case series from Kentucky um, uh, looking at uh, gastropexy alone, basically. And their conclusions um, after you know, looking at, at their experience was that laparoscopic parasophageal hernia repair um, is, should be the standard of care for giant parasophageal hernias, but that patients with high operative risk could be candidates for a shorter operative intervention like gastropexy. And um, in these patients who receive gastropexy alone, the continued use of antacids is more common, sometimes required. Um, but that gastropexy, in their experience, did restore the ability to tolerate meals and resulted in excellent patient satisfaction. Arevalo published a study out of Indiana. It, so in this in this series, they were looking exclusively at emergent repairs. So they had they reviewed 13 emergent repairs. And these were elderly patients. Um, they performed an anterior chiroplasty. So they did do some repair of the hiatus in all of these patients in addition to the gastropexy. Um, and the gastropexy technique with T-fasteners is shown in this, uh, in this illustration from the publication. They did not have any mortalities in their series. They concluded that uh, laparoscopic parasophageal repair with adjunct gast gastropexy or G2 placement should be considered in emergent cases for elderly patients with predominantly obstructive symptoms as an alternative to fund application. Um, there's also a publication from the University of Washington group where uh, 11 patients were reviewed. These were um, not all emergent, potentially elective, but they were elderly patients who were considered to be frail um, and therefore were considered for sort of a shorter operative time intervention of gastropexy. Um, they had both uh, suture gastropexy and G-tube uh, procedures in this series, and they did find that they had to do two reoperations for displaced G-tubes. The follow-up in this, in this study was relatively short, so the median follow-up was three months. They did find in that time frame that all of the patients remained free of gastric obstructive symptoms and recurrent episodes of volvulus. Um, only one patient in this series received nutrition via the gastrostomy tube. So they concluded that gastropexy can treat obstructed gastric volvulus in high-risk patients, but that gastrostomy tubes should be placed selectively because of the potential issues with gastrostomy tubes, again, in that series, the, dislo the dislodgement in two patients. Um, I also worry sometimes about increased <coughs> postoperative pain in patients with transfascial sutures for a sutured gastropexy or with a G-tube. So there was a recent review. Um, so these are not my conclusions, but these are the conclusions from that review by Dreyfus and colleagues, that most of the available recommendations for parasophageal hernia repair are based on prospective and retrospective reports with relatively low numbers, lack of standardized surgical technique and outcomes. Due to insufficient evidence, a case-by-case -case approach considering patient's characteristics seems to be reasonable. And that's basically what I do. But um, since I was invited to present, I get to talk a little bit more about what I do and have the last word. Um, I do gastropexy every fund application at the hiatus, and a, a, an illustration of that is, is basically shown here. As far as the anterior gastropexy, um, I've used it uh, not frequently, but I have used the anterior approach along the greater curvature, especially for cases of recurrence. Um, with volvulus, recurrent hernias, or occasionally for primary parasophageal hernias that I'm repairing that are, are very large with gastric volvulus, where I think they may have a higher recurrence risk. Um, and actually, after doing this review, I think I may consider using the anterior gastropexy approach more commonly in my larger hernias, because really anything I can do to re reduce recurrence would be fantastic. Um, and then with regard to G-tubes, really we should only be putting those in if we think there's a separate indication to have a G-tube for the patient. For example, you know, malnutrition, oropharyngeal swallowing issues, um, those typical reasons why you might think about putting in a G-tube. And otherwise, I think if you want to add gastropexy, it's safer to use a sutured approach.
Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Hi, Posner from Buffalo. Oh, loud, sorry. Um, in 1997, I left my fellowship and the very first paraesophageal hernia I did. I had a little bit of a shortening of the esophagus, so I ended up doing a gastropexy under tension, and the next day, the posterior aspect of the fundoplication was in the chest. And it's been my experience that most of the recurrences are lateral cardiofundic junction or posterior stomach. And so an anterior gastroplexy alone, I don't think is really going to prevent a recurrence. It may prevent a massive recurrence with a volvulus that obstructs. Yeah, I'm not sure I heard all of that. It sounded a little bit more like a comment than a question, but I, I think I agree with you. So um, the data that we do have, basically is that we should perform all of the components of a traditional paraesophageal hernia repair when we feel like we can. Um, and then adding an anterior gastroprexy may be something that is helpful for further reducing recurrence rates based on the available data, which are mostly large case series. Um, so yes, I, I do not, I really, I'm not sure if I've ever, maybe once performed gastroprexy alone, but it's not the ideal procedure. For sure. So I have a question. So, did, did you, in either in your own practice or when you were uh, doing your, you know, review for this paper, do you have any recommendations for for all of us as far as the actual technique of the gastropexy? Because I, I can tell you personally, <laughs> I've operated on a handful of patients who had had just a G2 placement or just right. a single stitch gastropexy where they just came back in and everything was volvulized around the G-tube or the gastropexy site. So if yeah. I have to do some sort of a gastropexy during usually an emergency operation, I really sort of run a stitch like all the way down the greater curvature of the stomach to the anterior abdominal wall so there's not just a single point of fixation. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I actually had one of those cases recently too. So. Um, I think that if you're going to do gastropexy, you need to do more than, you know, you need to do multiple points of fixation because uh, that's, that's just more secure. Um, and so the, the generally recommended or published method of doing this, which is what, what I do, is to put multiple sutures along the greater curve and bring them out through the abdominal wall in, in roughly the location where you would bring out a G-tube, right, um, in that area. And so um, I do it with transfascial sutures with a suture passer, and I do it in an interrupted fashion, but I'll typically put in four, maybe five sutures along the greater curve. Ellen, one question. So for your, for your gastropexies, like what, do you have some algorithm or just the giant paras get a pexy or like who do you decide, like who gets a pexy? Um, typically it's just based on how angry I am during the case. But no, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I do, I think, like I said, recurrent hernias, I'm more likely to do it because I, I are, like they've already failed once. So I kind of want to use a kitchen sink approach. Um, but yeah, I think patients who are starting out with, you know, the really, the giant, giant paraesophageals with gastric volvulus, I'd be more likely to do this because really, as you mentioned, I don't think that, as our, our audience uh, member mentioned, the anterior gastropexy isn't necessarily going to prevent that recurrence at the hiatus, but it can prevent somebody from totally re-herniating and volvulizing again. And so that's the patients where I think about it more.